So I'll just uh, introduce you and then I'm gonna go with the first uh, question. Okay. Welcome! Trovi la puntata sottotitolata in italiano su YouTube. This is Strano Podcast and we usually talk about feeling weird, strange, different from the other people and how it affects our lives and the things we do. Today's guest wrote so, 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 so many songs that I love so, so, so much. I mean, they're anthems. And once you fall in love with them, they stick with you forever. He plays guitar and sings in a band from Kansas a band formed in 1995, a band named The Get Up Kids. But he also plays as a solo artist and played in other musical projects such as The New Amsterdam's and The Terrible Twos. After all these years, after all the excellent music he put out and after all the shows he played, he surely has something to write home about and a lot of stories ah. to tell. <laughs> so I just can't wait to start. My friends, my guest today is Matt Pryor from The Get Up Kids. Hi Matt, how are you? I'm good, man. How are you? That was that was cringy. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, thanks for being here. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Yes, of course. So, first thing I always ask all of my guests is, have you ever felt weird, strange, different from the other people? And if yes, did it affect uh, your music and the things you do? I, you know, you've sent me these questions and I was a little like, uh, yeah. It's 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 interesting because I I've been uh, uh, been writing a book for the last couple of months and I have a, a whole lot in there about my time in like grade school and high school and how I uh, very much felt like an outsider and I didn't fit in with the people I was going to school with I didn't really have very many if any friends until I discovered punk rock and then I found people with like a common interest and a commonality and it really it really saved my life I think but I was still you know I started playing in bands when I was 15 so the whole time I was in high school I felt you know I almost just leaned into how different I was from from everybody else I mean granted I was an angry white kid in a catholic school angry white guy in a catholic school and so it wasn't really that different <laughs> but I felt like I was yeah yeah, I know what you mean. And by the way, uh, what's the most precious thing you've got from feeling strange? The most precious thing I've got from feeling strange, probably a, a sense of individuality and a, a stubbornness that I have. I have to fight my initial... Can we swear on this? Yeah, sure. Okay. My default setting whenever I'm confronted or criticized about anything or, or being told that I'm different is just to say, like, well, fuck you then. And, you know, it's not the healthiest attitude to have. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I try to not lean into it too much. Still talking about growing up, what's one of the most scary or dangerous things you've done as a child or as an adolescent looking back on it? Uh, well, this wasn't intentional, but I did go into a diabetic coma when I was in sixth grade. So that's pretty scary. But uh, that wasn't something that was I planned. <laughs> oh, just... God. Yeah. Yes. That's scary. That's scary. So what if a magic spell could turn you into any frontman, dead or alive, of any band for one summer only? Who would you choose? See, this is hard for me because I'm, even though I am... I sing 90% of the songs. I don't think of myself as a frontman. It's sort of a, a character that I've kind of developed. And to the point where like traditional frontmen, with the exception of Freddie Mercury, kind of rub me the wrong way. Like it seems to be sort of like the thing in, in rock music that it felt like punk rock was rebelling against, even though there are a lot of great punk rock, you know, front men um, and front women in front non-binary people but you know it, it's so i i don't i don't know if i have an answer to that because i also know that like when i go oh well then i would be freddie mercury and then it's just like well but he had kind of a rough tortured existence <laughs> in his personal life you know so that's why the i'm uh, i usually ask if for one summer only because for the whole life could be pretty yeah so i i guess if it was for one summer i would say freddie mercury because i think he he's 
above and beyond the greatest frontman rock and roll's ever produced. And I think it would be pretty fun as well because I think they had a blast like playing so many shows and huge shows. So mm -hmm. must be pretty fun too. I agree. So talking about the Get Up Kids, which uh, of your records was the most fun in the making and which one was the least fun? I mean, at least for you. Uh, I would say the most fun was probably either something to write home about which because it was such a new experience or the last record we made problems which is kind of a a bit of a sister record to that record problems was really fun because we're all old enough now to know that we need space and know when we're pushing each other's buttons and stuff like that so it it just makes for a, a better working environment until we start drinking and then it gets a little <laughs> a little more aggressive uh but we wouldn't really do that until it was the end of the after the session was after the day was over but my least favorite to make was probably i don't know none of them uh well though it's one of my favorite records of ours uh guilt show is pretty difficult to make if you listen to the vagrant podcast you can hear that how we were never in the same room at the same time both Jim and I were frustrated and, and I was incredibly depressed and ultimately the band, you know, broke up a year after that record came out. So though I think up until the last record came up until Problems came out, Guilt Show was my favorite record of ours. But it was not a, a pleasant experience to make. There was a lot of a lot of butting heads. Yeah, and by the way, you were mentioning the Vagrant podcast, and uh, I was just telling you how much I loved it. And I was really, really surprised to find out uh, all the story behind uh, the Guild Show record, because uh, I love that record a lot. I love it so much. And when I listened to it, I, like, I mean, I would never say that you were not in the same room all the time, that you were not like enjoying uh, recording it, because it's... It's such a well-made record, I think, so. I think that's a credit to Ed Rose who produced the record because he, he really did act as the sixth member of the band and he, um, he was steering the ship the whole time because it, it, otherwise it would have been a really scatterbrained um, affair. Talking about touring, tell me about uh, a few of the weirdest or craziest uh, things you've seen or experienced on the road in all these years with any band you played in. Uh, there must be so so many so i'm trying to think because I, i did i did just write about this recently so there's a, a lot of things that, that come to mind you know the first time that we toured in a tour bus was pretty crazy because we were being driven by a sociopath who would come to our shows drunk and yell show us your tits at the crowd and it was like uh You know, and we didn't, we were too young. We didn't know we could fire him. <laughs> so we had never... It was not an option yet. No, well, it was, we just didn't know it. I'll tell you the one that, that's the kind of craziest that I, I always kind of think back on whenever anybody asks me this question is we played a house show in Iowa one time and it was in this like really small town. And so like, it was just a whole interesting mix of humanity there. There was just punks, jocks, nerds, cheerleaders, like the whole breakfast club gamut. And uh, this guy's name was Bug, and we were playing at his house, but it wasn't his house. It was his mom's house. And when I met his mom, she had a, a feeding tube in her stomach, right? Because she couldn't swallow. And she, she got in the drawer and pulled out a hypodermic syringe and filled it up with schnapps and just injected it into her feeding tube. That's crazy. And then went into the other and then she talked to me for a little bit i don't know how she was alive to be honest she went into the other room and she hooked herself up to this like iv drip of fluids that i'm pretty sure was beer like it was because it looked it looked like urine in a bag but it was like and they were i just remember her and her husband were watching empire strikes back and i was just like what the fuck is going on <laughs> and then it turned out that everybody in like half the crowd were tripping on acid during our set And so this one girl was just like, I can see your aura when you play. And I was like, fuck off, Moonbeam. Like, it was a pretty wild, pretty wild party. A lot of those, like, really early on, like, house shows, just because of the, the way the scene was and the people who were willing to go stand in a basement with 40 other gross teenagers or 20-somethings was, you know, just an interesting mix of people. So a lot of those are pretty, pretty, pretty crazy, but... 
you know, and then some like international stuff, like, I mean, hell still, I've done it twice now, but still in Italy, t- the two most crazy airports, I, I mean, the Bologna airport mm-hmm. at 555 is dead. And then at six o'clock on the money is packed with humanity wow. in the <laughs> first thing in the morning. <laughs> it's just like, it's the most maddening thing I've ever seen in my life. It's, it's chaotic. If you had the chance uh, uh, to get on a time machine and you could go anywhere in time, where or better, when would you go and what would you do? Huh. I don't know. The first things that I think of are are food related. Like I would have loved to have eaten at Charlie Trotter's before he he passed away. I would have uh I would have loved to have met Anthony Bourdain before he passed away. You know, there's also a thing where like there was this all ages club when I was in high school that only lasted for a year, but really was like probably the most influential thing in my young life after discovering punk rock as far as like, you know, learning how to run a show, learning how to book a band, learning how to do the door, learning how to kick people out, learning how to, and then also learning how to play on a stage, you know? At the time, I was just a guitar player in a, in a in kind of a noise rock band, but like watching the singer of the band like command the room was very uh, educational. So if anything, I think I wouldn't hate going back to that time in kind of a like Christmas Carol ghost sort of way where I could just observe, you know, and sort of like being invisible. Yeah. I don't know that I'd want to go back and relive that time, but you know, it, it was certainly, it was a very, um, influential part of my, my young life. I bet. By the way, in all these years, you've made a lot of records and played so many shows as a solo artist and with the Get Up Kids, with New Amsterdam's, The Terrible Twos, Reg and the Full Effect. Looking back on it, do you feel like each record and musical phase is somehow representative of who you were in those moments? I mean, does your discography work as a photo diary of the past three decades for you? Uh, yeah, kind of. I don't know if it if it's something that translates to other people because, you know, you put your own associations on a time and place of, of a record, but it's kind of like, I heard somebody say, because I, I like tattoos, I have a lot of tattoos, and I heard somebody saying that like, because people are like, oh, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna regret that when you're older or whatever. And this one guy I know who's a tattoo artist was just like, nah, it's really just kind of like a photograph. It's sort of like a time and place, you know, that piece of artwork kind of represents who you were at that moment in your life. And I kind of think records are the same way. And it's one thing for me as the artist to to be like, I can listen to that record, any given record, and be like, okay, I know what I was thinking about at that time. And like when we go back and listen to our, the first Get Up Kids record, I'm just like, you're such a little fucking kid. You know, it's just like the person singing is young and unsure of themselves and doesn't have a whole lot of life experience. And then going on to like something we're at home about where it's just like, okay, this is someone who's now toured for two and a half years and has been through the ringer in that regard and and been through a bad record label experience. And I hear all of that in that moment. And I can pinpoint that stuff in every single record I've ever made, except for maybe the terrible twos, but except that I can feel like those songs really aren't about anything. And except I can can listen to it and be like, oh yeah, I remember when my kids were little. (laughs) Yeah, I guess that makes sense. By the way, uh, I was talking about the Vagrant podcast and there's so much of the story of the Get Up Kids in there. And uh, I was wondering, were all those memories there for you? Or did you have to think a lot about it to bring all of those memories back? No, they're all, they're all still pretty fresh for me in that, in that particular time period. You know, one of the interesting things about talking to the other guys in the band is that we do remember things differently. And that's kind of part of the thing, too, of like, you know, you, you tell stories about your life for 20 years when people ask, like I've done in interviews. And then of course that story probably evolves, you know, like I think my memory is 80% accurate, (laughs) you know, but the other people involved, you know, sometimes remember things differently, including like, you know, our, our former manager and the record label 
people. That was something also that was very interesting about that podcast. The fact that sometimes each of you would come out with a different kind of a different story about something and Well, it's it's kind of interesting because it's kind of the jumping off point of the whole podcast is that initially everyone thought that Face to Face owned the record label. You know, it's <laughs> just like and they didn't. <laughs> and we're all just like, "Wait, what? I thought I just made that was That's the assumption I've had for 30 years, you know, or 25 years. It makes sense because until you don't speak about it with other people, you don't realize that your memories might not be accurate. Mm -hmm. So I would like to ask you about uh, the fact that you basically broke up for like three or four years. It was a very short breakup after all. And then you came back and now you've been uh, together even more than you've been the first time. How did it feel to get back in the first place? I mean, was it easy to get back together and enjoy time together after the experience of breaking up? Uh, no, it was pretty enjoyable. You know, the thing that we realized is that like we didn't really need to break up in the first place. We needed a break from each other for a while because we had basically been living and working together and traveling together for 10 straight years and we were changing and and I needed a break and you know, after three years it was kind of like, okay, I think we're chill enough now and it was fun to like have people be excited about us getting back together that was a a happy feeling yeah and you can really see that when i saw you playing shows you can really see that uh, you are enjoying what you're doing i think that comes out from your music and from your shows well thank you uh, if you could choose any artist uh, you could uh, record a song with dead or alive who would you choose um Elliot Smith. Wow. Since you said dead or alive. I don't know if we would get along. I don't know if our songwriting styles would clash, but I would just like to be in the room and to watch him work, you know? Wow, yeah. Yeah, and I'd love to hear that. Where did you find out that uh, Pitchfork created uh, something to write home about, like 2.5, and did you even give a fuck about it? Well, to answer the second half, I didn't give a fuck about it, and I still don't. <laughs> and we got bad record reviews universally for that record when it came out. But the shows kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I was just like, well, fuck them then. And they're like, oh, Pitchfork only gave it a two. And I just remember being like, what the fuck is Pitchfork? <laughs> you know, and just like, it's like, oh, it's like Tastemakers. And I'm like, okay, whatever. Like, people are coming to the shows, so, you know. That's all I really cared about. I agree. Yeah, and by the way, uh, people are still loving that record, so that's enough, I think. Yeah. Do you plan to make uh, other solo music in the future? or? Yeah, I, I, I would like to. I kind of go through these phases of like, I want to play loud and then I want to play quiet. And I'm kind of getting to the point where I've been playing loud for a while now, and so I kind of want to do something quiet. You know, that's part of the reason I've been writing this book is because that's about as quiet of a thing as you can possibly do, <laughs> you know? Like. Yeah, for sure. By the way, can I ask you something about this book you, you're talking about? What it is all about and... I mean, it's I'm just writing it right now, so it's almost done. The way I've been kind of describing it to my friends is it's sort of like a stylized memoir. So it's kind of like written not in a, in a traditional like memoir way, but it is about me and my life starting with going into a diabetic coma and going up through uh, the year 2000. So it's just within, it's like 1991 to 2000. It's just within those parameters. So it's a lot of like, you know, stories about early music scene and friends and punk rock. And there's a lot of mental health stuff in there as, lo as well as a lot of like, you know, physical health with, you know, being a diabetic and, and touring, you know, and I have to like up and you know for the first couple of tours we did i had to bring you know syringes with me everywhere that we went and then up kind of getting into like the band touring and our rigid schedule but it's my perspective on all of that like if you want to hear a more accurate account of like what the band collectively was going through you should just go listen to the vagrant podcast at, during you know during this time this is just more about like you know my thoughts and feelings on all night drives in the van and, and stuff like that. Uh, and then kind of leading up to the first New Am's record and me getting married and that change in my life. So yeah, I don't know. I'll either find somebody to put it out or I'll self-release it or something, but it's just something I've always wanted to do. I'm almost done with the first draft and that feels like an accomplishment in and of itself. Can't wait to read that. Sounds good. 
So uh, you were mentioning mental health. Um, since it is something uh, I really like to talk about on my podcast, I was wondering uh, if you could tell us what did you have to deal with, if you feel like talking about it, of course. Uh, no, that's... I actually, I like talking about this stuff. I think the more that we talk about it, the less um, stigmatized we, we make it. I agree. I suffer from bouts of anxiety and... Okay, if things get really bad, then the uh, panic attacks, that those are usually very specific to high stress situations. I do battle depression, though I, my depression never gets so bad that I think everything is hopeless. So I feel lucky in, in that regard. I'll just be like, oh, I'm depressed. I'm going to have to wait this out. <laughs> you know, there's just nothing I can do about it. But uh, the way that I try to deal with those things now is through exercise and meditation and like like exercise meaning like especially over the pandemic i would just go walk i would just go walk and i'd end up walking for like two hours just to get out of the house and because it was like the only safe thing to do and that really helped like kind of clear my head and then uh, uh you know i try to meditate every day for at least 10 minutes and if not more and um both of those things have really helped the thing that if i was in particular, especially because I've been living in the mind of this younger person that I, I was in the 90s, is that there's a real weird thing when you're in a band, even when you're in a successful band, that I don't think people understand, is that like it's an hour of absolute worship of people watching you play. And then as soon as you get into the van, you are nothing. You're nobody. You walk into a gas station. You're you're just some dickhead at a gas station. So it's like probably 23 hours of like loneliness and driving <laughs> and stuff like that. And then you just have this one brief hour, one 24th of your day is this like dizzying kind of ecstasy of, of performing. And so like the come down from that is really kind of difficult. And that's I think that's why a lot of people end up getting into to substances because like you don't want that high of being on stage to go away but it you have to learn how to balance those two things of being like like i sometimes get real anxiety attacks right before we're about to walk on stage it has nothing to do with the performance it could be any anything other stuff that's going on in my life maybe but then as soon as i step on that stage i just like just like a, a switch flips it's just like this is not about me anymore i have to push down my fears and anxieties in order to perform for people so that they can forget about their fears and anxieties for an hour an hour and a half and you know i've been doing it for 25 years so i've gotten pretty good at it <laughs> you know so you know when people tell me that like songs that i've written have helped them get through things i, I find that immensely flattering because i feel the same way about other artists and in the moment, I never know how to respond <laughs> to it, you know, but it's just, there's no like stock answer. You know what I mean? When someone's like, yeah, you, you helped me get through when my mom died of cancer. I'm just like, oh, uh, glad I could help, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> like, you know, I don't know what to say. Yeah, because they, they're talking about something huge in such a short sentence and, and with a short time to do it. So, but I mean, I understand because like the songs, Oftentimes, my songs for me are th a form of therapy for myself. So, like, you know, it's something I need to get off my chest or release into the world. So I understand. I just kind of, like, no one's given me a good enough, like, you know, <laughs> sort of, like, stock answer. Yeah, true. Yeah, that's... Uh, well, anyway, thanks for, for sharing this side of your, of your life. Yeah. As you say, the more we talk about it, the less it's scary, you know. You were talking about the lockdown. Was it a, a good time for writing music or doing creative stuff, or was it not? It wasn't really for me. It was a good time, at least initially, you know, because initially it was kind of like summer camp, sort of. It was just like, everybody stay home and drink. And because uh, it was spring and it was nice out, so I ended up doing a lot of, like, projects around the house. Like, I built a chicken coop, and I built a picnic table for our backyard, and I put in a bunch of raised beds for the garden and all this stuff. And then, you know, over the summer, around the time that Black Lives Matter protests started happening, I started getting real, real dark, real dark. And so then I just didn't feel motivated to do anything. And that took a, that took a while to come out of. Um, 
But, you know, I've been able to be more creative now. Like I said, I've been writing a book. I just, you know, we did the Vagrant podcast is still, you know, being edited and, and more episodes are coming out. We did like, oh my God, like 70 hours of interviews for that thing. Wow. That sounds fun. It was fun. It was a little exhausting because you're kind of asking, especially when you're talking to multiple people from the same band, because you're asking the same questions over and over again. But, you know, I think it's so far it's turned out really, really well. Was there anyone you talked for the first time in years? Kind of. John Reese from Rocket from the Crip is one of my heroes. I've talked to him on occasion, but that's like the longest conversation I've ever had with him. And then Craig from the Hold Steady, I've met, but we never really have talked. Buddy from Senses Fail, I had met once at a show, but I didn't know anything about him or anything about that band. And so I actually had to go do research on Senses Fail in order to like have the interview. But luckily he, he'll talk your ear off without even prompting. So, you know, that was, that was cool. And then I, you know, you haven't got to hear them in the podcast. Well, you, a little bit, you got to hear Max. Like I, I love talking to Max and say anything. And I got to talk to Kevin Devine and to Andy from Manchester Orchestra, and I hope they'll be making an appearance at some point soon because we did full interviews with them. So, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. Wow. Yeah, so everyone go check it out. It's an amazing podcast. So last thing I'm going to ask you is, is something I ask all of my guests is to suggest as a song, a book, and a movie. They don't have to be your favorite, just, you know, just stuff you like, you enjoy Song, okay, so there's this, I mean, they're technically a bluegrass band, but they're a lot more than that. Well, there's this guy, Chris Thiele, who's a, a mandolin player. He's like a mandolin prodigy. It's just a massively talented songwriter. And I mean, he's, a, he's an amazing mandolin player, but I really don't give a shit about that. He's like a really good songwriter. and He's a really creative guy. And uh, he was in a band called Nickel Creek that was just, you know, mandolin, acoustic guitar, and fiddle. And they have a song on a record called... Is it called When Did the Fire Die is the name of the record? But the song's called Helena, and it's kind of the most emo song I've ever heard in my life. Like, it's very just, like, big and powerful in a kind of, like, mineral or sunny day kind of way, but it's done on mandolin, acoustic guitar, and fiddle and bass, upright bass. I think a lot of people get turned off when they see that instrumentation, if they're, like, fans of, like, rock music, you know? With the exception of maybe like Mumford and Sons, you know, like people get kind of like, <laughs> and so that's one I would recommend. He has another band called the Punch Brothers, which is just like beyond amazing band. Book wise, I mean, my favorite book of all time is The Godfather, but that seems kind of on the nose. You know what I did? Re I re-listened to, because I got the audio book, again, because I've been walking. I walk so much, I listen to a lot of audio books in instead of reading them. And I re-downloaded Anthony Bourdain's Kitchen Confidential, which was his first memoir and kind of thing that like propelled him into the public spotlight and kind of a inspiration for the kind of book I'm trying to write. And just hearing it in his voice, he was just such a huge influence on me, both honestly as a, a fan of budding foodie, as a traveler, as a even as a musician and kind of like the mercenary work. Kitchens are similar to like clubs, you know, in the sense of like it's all like the weirdest people <laughs> yeah you know. i've never thought about it i guess that's true yeah what's a movie that i really liked there's tons of movies that i really like you know what's a really interesting movie there's this movie called swiss army man and it's got daniel radcliffe in it and he plays a corpse like a talking corpse <laughs> and uh andy and uh i can't remember the guitar player from manchester orchestra's name but they did the soundtrack and it, a lot of it's acapella and it's really, really interesting. But the movie itself is kind of a meditation in like depression. And, you know, this guy kind of creates his own reality because of a trauma that he's gone through. It's just a really beautiful, beautiful movie. I like it a lot. That or anything Taika Waititi is involved in at all, because that guy's hilarious. Cool. Okay. So thanks a lot, Matt. Thanks a lot for taking the time. Yeah, of course. Telling me your stories. Really appreciate it. Yeah, man. Thanks a lot for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, remember to share it with your friends and loved ones and check out my other episodes in English. I've been talking with so many cool people. I've been talking with Bill Stevenson from The Descendants and Black Flag, Laura Jane Grace from Against Me, with Solinego from Propagani, with Tim Kinsella from Cap and Jazz and Joan of Arc. 
with Gail Farina from Karate, with Chris Leo from The Vampelt, and so, so, so many more. Thanks for listening. Bye.